charging and seating. Those are pretty straightforward processes. The not so straightforward parts, the testing. And that's because with testing, you can get as complicated as you want these days, depending on what you're after on you know, precision from your ammo, from your loads. And keep in mind what I said last time about precision. You're going to pay a price for precision. There's a cost to it. Be it time, money, effort, you're going to pay for it. And the same way on the testing. If you're really wanting to get into the precision side, it costs more. Time, money, effort. Okay. Well, depending on what you're doing, you may or may not need a lot of precision. So... What I'm going to do, rather than explain the different tests just at once, just you know, throwing all that out there and me talking for an hour about testing, I'm just going to go ahead and load up my cartridges and then explain what I'm going to do with each one. And okay, I'm going to load up for the FN Supreme 30 out 6 I'm going to run one type of test with it. I'm going to load up the 1903A3. I'm going to run a different test with it. And I'm also going to load for the Winchester Model 70 Westerner that I was working on earlier this year. And I'm going to run a third type of test for it. So I'll explain the methodology for each type of testing as we go. And by the end, I think you'll understand the whole testing thing and the different tests that are out there and what different people are trying to achieve with different tests. I think it'll make more sense that way. And hopefully it's not going to be quite as boring as opposed to just me talking for an hour about testing. My process for the FN starting from scratch. The very first thing I'm going to do is fill out a load sheet. And I create a load sheet for every load I do for every rifle. I have a notebook here that I've got tabs inside the notebook. Each tab is every rifle I own. And when I do a load for that rifle, I'll put it under that tab. So the very first thing I'm going to do is just fill out the information here. And I'll, I'll bring that up here so y'all can see it. Okay, so we got temperature and date. I'm going to fill that in at the range. We got cartridge. Right, so that's going to be 30 out 6. Rifle. FN Supreme. Brass, Remington. Wind, fill that in at the range. Make of the brass, or brand. Okay, that's going to be spear. Type, round nose. Weight, 165 grains. Ballistic coefficient. Okay, for the ballistic coefficient, I don't even know if that's on the box. I do not see it. But that's okay. I, I'd said before the, these round noses that I picked up, I didn't have the information on it because I discontinued it. And it wasn't in my spear manual. Well, Mitch was so nice to actually send me a photo from his manual, the 12th edition of the Spear Reloading Manual, that had this bullet and all the information. Mitch, thank you very much for that. That is greatly appreciated. And him sending me that also allowed me to confirm that the Spear load data is the same for the round nose as it is their other 165 grain bullets. I was fairly certain it was, now I know for sure. Mitch, greatly appreciate it. And that also gave me the ballistic coefficient, which is going to help later on with calculating maximum point blank range. So anyway, let's get this filled in. Ballistic coefficient. And you can look this up for your bullet off of you know their website. So this is going to be 275, which means these are not aerodynamic at, a, at all. And I don't care. They're going to do a really good job when they actually hit the animal. Okay, humidity, again, at the range. Powder. IMR. 4350. 
max load, 58 grains, min load, 54, and you'll notice on the computer, I've got this spreadsheet set up so that it automatically fills in my load values. But we're going to go over this manually so that you, know, you can see how to do this and you don't need a spreadsheet. It's really not complicated. Okay. O drive length. That's the length I want to set my bullets to from the base to the O drive. We'll get into that in a minute. We don't have that right now. Jam length. We need that. Okay, so that's something we're going to collect real quick. I've got the FN action right here. There's a lot of ways to do this. I ain't even going to get into them, but for me, just the quickest, simplest is to use the Hornaday. They've got a gauge here that you put a case on. It's lock and load. I don't even remember what they call it. All right, so I'm screwing that case into this gauge. This slides in and out. I'm taking the exact bullet that I'm about to load. I'm inserting it in here. All right, so it's barely in. Okay. This is not required, by the way. You don't have to do this. Okay. This gets back to what I said before about the precision and so forth. You, there is a length in the manual that you can load to and it's going to work and you don't have to do all this stuff. I like doing this, but this is the more precision you want, the more time, money, effort. So we're putting in some more time, money, and effort right now. You, know, you got to get your case cases. You buy these from Hornaday. They're tapped in the bottom. You can make them yourself from once fired brass. That works great for a particular rifle, but and, this is, and you know, for me, this is just quickest, simplest, easiest. So we're going to insert this into the chamber. Loosen this. I'm going to push that bullet forward. We're going to lock this down. Okay. And what I did was I pushed the bullet forward until it actually hit the lands inside the barrel. So we have two inches, 797 thousandths. Now let's check it again. And I'm going to write that down real quick. And sometimes your bullets will stick when doing this. Keep cleaning rod handy. Two inches, eight hundred and one thousandths. If those two numbers had been exactly the same, I'd stop right there because they weren't. I'm going to do it a third time and then just take the average of them. There's going to be variations in this. Some of the, I know Sinclair makes some steel gauges that you can use to check those the job distance and so forth. I've heard those were a lot more consistent than the Hornaday, which are made out of aluminum, and I don't doubt that they are more consistent. The steel works. If I had it to do over again, I would probably go with the Sinclairs, but they're more expensive. Again, this, this does work, and, and again, this isn't, you don't have to do this, especially for as simple of a test as I'm going to do on this one. Two inches, 799 thousandths. And we're going to call it two inches, 799, which is the average of the three. We're going to fill that in for jam length. Okay, how far off the lands do I want to be? And that's why we're getting this information. 
I want to be approximately twenty thousandths off the lands. That just that's a just a number. A lot of you know people that load up for rifles have used for a long time. It just seems to be a good starting point. But because I know there's variation in the numbers and discrepancies and so forth, I'm going to go with twenty-three thousandths. So that gives me a little margin of error there. It's going to keep me on the higher side of 20 versus the lower side. And the lower side's okay. It's just the closer you get to the lands, the more pressure you're going to get. And for a long time, bench rest shooters, and they might still do, I don't know, they would actually create loads with the bullet actually touching the lands when they chambered it. But they had reduced pressures and their or reduced charges in their cartridges to reduce the pressure because that creates a lot of pressure quick. And they created very specialized loads for what they were doing. We're not doing that. I want it twenty thousandths off thereabouts and and then you can get into load testing or length testing for accuracy after that if you want to and we'll talk about that one later. But Okay, so I'm shooting for 23 thousandths off, so I subtract the 23 thousandths from that 2 inches 793, and then that's going to give me the length that I want to load to when I actually do the seating at the press for the bullet. So we've already got that information in here. We've got our length now that we need to set our seating die to when we go to actually load the bullets. But we've got a problem. And I thought we might run into this. General rule of thumb. You want your bullet sitting as far in the brass, as deep, as what the diameter of the bullet itself is. All right, so this is a 30 caliber. It's .308 diameter. So you want about 300 thousandths of the bullet actually in the neck of the case. Well, I just measured this, and the length of our bullet is 990 thousandths. But we've got 710 thousandths sticking out so here. Subtract that from the overall length of the bullet. We've got about 280 thousandths actually in contact with the neck. 280 thousandths, if this was 7 millimeter, that'd be perfect. That's still a lot of surface for the case to actually grip as far as in the neck on the bullet. And I feel sure we would be fine with that. But I'm going to add, I'm going to put seat the bullet 20, an extra 20 thousandths deeper. All right, so instead of being 23 thousandths off the lands we're going to end up at 40,000, 43,000 off the lands. Okay. I'm okay with that. And when we do our testing, if our accuracy is not where we want it, then we can go back later and we can, you know, we can do some testing as far as for the length of where we seat the bullet. So we got options there, but we're going to go with that for this one, just I want as much surface gripping the bullet as possible. I want to make sure we've got really good ammo for this rifle for what we're doing. This is my semi scary game rifle. <laughs> I want dependability, and I, I'm sure the 280 thousandths be fine. That's still a lot of surface. We're gonna add the extra and see what we get. And we're also probably going to run into this with the 150 grain bullets in the 1903A3. All right, the lighter your bullets, the more you run into this. And this is tricky because gen generally the precision long range guys, they want the long bullets, the heavy bullets, because that's going to give them better ballistic coefficient usually, more energy downrange, less affected by wind, things like that. But they're shooting, you know, way out there, you know, six, seven, eight hundred yards. 
we're not doing that. And as hunters, generally a hunter wants to be on the lighter end of the bullets to increase velocity so that you get a longer maximum point blank range. So that's why so many hunters favor the 130 grain and the 270 versus the 150 to get the higher velocity to shoot further. We're not worried about shooting far in this rifle. It's just going to be short range, intermediate range. Um, you know, but with 1903A3 with that 150 grain, and this is the 165, so the 150 is going to be even shorter. So, you know, we're probably going to run into that with that one also. But that's what we're going to load at on this one. We'll see what we get. And, uh, you know, then, again, we, we can run tests for different seating depths to dial that in later on. Which, hey, this might work out perfect right here where it's at. We'll find out. Testing for the FN. This is as simple and basic of a test as you could do, and this is most of my testing. And basically, I'm figuring out how many cartridges I want to load for a group or shoot for a group. So three, four, or five. In my case, four. I tried three. I just don't have as much confidence in it. I'm going back to four. I feel like I get more information. And it, it's yeah, I'm using more components, firing more shots, but I feel like it's better use of my time just because I'm confident in what I'm getting back versus three shots. So I'm going to have five different groups with four shots per group, so that's going to be 20 rounds. I'm going to have each group at a different powder charge. So I'm incrementally increasing my charge as I go up from the lowest charge to the highest. The increment that you go up, you know, is, there's all kinds of, of ways you can figure this out. Some people use a set. They're going to use 0.3 grains per increment or 0.2 or whatever. I'm using a percentage. And for me, that works out a lot better because you can't just say I'm going to use 0.3 as my increment because what if you're doing a pistol cartridge? Uh, the smaller the case, the smaller your powder charge, and you've got really small charges in a pistol cartridge, you can't just use a 0.3 increment there. By using a percentage, that works with any cartridge you ever want to do. And it's really simple. So let me explain how you come up with this. And I'm using... 1% increment. So each, I'm starting at the max and then I'm subtracting 1% you know, all the way down for five groups. That's for a rifle that I have confidence in and powder that I've used and bullet that I've used and I don't have any concerns whatsoever. I'm going to start off 5% below the max, work my way up. Okay, if I have some concerns you know, maybe it's an older rifle, maybe just whatever. Um, a new powder I haven't used, a new bullet I haven't used. I'm going to back off 10% or to the minimum charge in the book for that particular load, whichever comes first. And usually you'll hit the minimum charge before you actually get 10% off. And what I'm doing there is I'll set up five different groups like what I just said, but then... For the 10% ranging, you see where I have my sheet broken up into 5% and 10%. Unless I just want to know the groups, the sizes and so forth, if I'm just concerned wanting to check for pressures, which is when I would do the 10% if I'm worried about pressures, I would just load one cartridge in that 10% range and then fire that cartridge, make sure no pressure sign, go up to the next, Make sure we're good there. All right, this FN, I fired it already. This 30 out 6 powder, a few many times. New bullet, but, you know, around those bullets and spears, they've been out forever. There's, I have no concerns there. And I have the actual reloading data from Spear now, thanks to Mitch. And so I know 100% that my load for that's good. So, in the spear manual, it lists that load from 54 to 58%. So, to calculate that, you start out 
at your 58 for the max. 1% of that, well that's real easy. You move your decimal place over to two places. So 0 0.58 is 1%. All we have to do is round that up to 0 0.6 and that's going to be our increment. So we have a 0 0.6 increment that we're going to do in between charges. So we take the 58, then we subtract 0 0.6 from that. We've got 57.4, then we subtract you know, 0 0.6 from that. 56.8, we subtract 0 0.6 again. 56.2, we subtract 0.6 again. Okay, so that's my charges right there. Except for keep in mind, I, I said we were going to download the FN. I don't want it at the max pressure. So I'm going to keep going with this. And we're probably going to start out for our max charge for this one. Just again, I'm, I'm just wanting to download it. We know 54 is our minimum. So if we start at 54, and then we just add 0 0.6 to that, and then we just keep adding 0 0.6, So that, that would be our numbers there, and somewhere in that range should be about perfect. So now I can take my load sheet and I can fill that information in, and then we'll have all of the data we need to actually start you know, loading our cartridges, charging them, and then seating. We have our load sheet filled out. So we have all of the information, or at least what we need for right now. I'll fill in, you know, results and things like that on the same sheet at the range when we do the actual testing. But everything we can fill in right now, we've done. But we know what length we're going to set our bullets at. We know what powder charge we're going to do for each group. It's written down. I double checked my math from the dry erase board. Actually, I triple-checked it, I, I said before, I don't trust myself, and I don't. And that's why I like using the Excel sheet, and it automatically calculating these values for me. It's one less error for me to make, but then I still go back and double-check it, make sure I've got the right charges in. You, know, you need to get this part right. You get this right, everything else just tends to go pretty smooth, usually. So, we're good here. Now we can actually start charging the cases and getting organized. Okay. We know we're going to do a test, or we're going to test 20 cartridges. So five groups, four shots per group, 20 cartridges. We know we need 20 pieces of brass. But I'm also going to load up eight extra cartridges. When we get to the range, I've got a zero of the rifle. I mean, I don't even have it put back together yet. We're going to have to mount the scope. So we're going to need some extra rounds with us when we get there. So I'm going to load up some extra ones. And I'll probably do those at the minimum charge. That way, you know, there's no concerns about pressure or whatever, um, which I'm not really concerned about these anyway. I might even go, you know, somewhere close to the middle of the range. But anyway, I'm just going to load up four, eight separate cartridges that we have to set the scope with. You know, so we got a few on hand. Because you don't want to, you don't want to go out there with three bullets to set your scope. Use those three and all you've got left is the ones you're going to test. So that's why you always have some extra, or you can just have some extra factory ammunition with you if you happen to have any. I'm running low on factory ammunition. so. We'll, we we'll have a few extra. Okay, with that said, I, I keep a box for every rifle, for every load, 
All right, so this is 30 out 6 FN. Okay, I've got my tray here that I've got all my brass on. And I had two boxes of Remington brass. I, I was only going to do, you know, one box, but I knew we were going to need the extra. And those two boxes were the same lot numbers. So I went ahead and just sized both boxes. That way I've always got the extra brass with it. And I wanted to keep those lot numbers together for consistency. So I figured just go ahead and do them all, get, get it done. So now, on my load tray, I only want the number of cartridges I'm going to load. By the press over here, when we actually go to seat the bullets, I only want the number of bullets I'm going to load. I want everything as absolutely orderly as possible so that when I finish up, when I put that last bullet in the last cartridge, you know, it's done. And if I've got a cartridge that's left over with no bullet in it, I'm going to scratch my head and go back and check everything. So now we have exactly 28 pieces of brass here, which is what we're going to load for. I'm pulling out my safety glasses. You do what you want. But when I start messing with primers, I want some safety glasses on. I don't know if you've ever had a primer go off or been around one when it did, but we'll just say they got a, a punch to them. All right, so I want exactly 28 primers, and I hand prime. Uh, with my press over there, I, I could use it to seek the primers. I just prefer hand primers. So I have 28 pieces of brass, I have 28 primers. I'm going to visually look, even though I've inspected this brass two or three times, I'm going to visually look in the primer pocket for every piece of brass before I prime it. Um, primers, they don't go off that easy. But get a something stuck in a brass pocket and then squeeze one in there and we'll just say it can set one off. So again, I'm going to make sure my pocket is clear. Give it a squeeze. And by hand priming, you, you can feel you know, how much tension is in that primer pocket. And I know I've got a good primer pocket here. I had good tension with it going in. You know, we've got good brass. For the depth, you want your primer actually seated below the case, and you want it three thousandths further in. And this is exactly three thousandths further in. And in fact, too, I love hand priming because there's just not much to go wrong with a hand priming setup, and as simple as it can be. We have 28 cartridges primed and ready to go. Now we need to dispense some powder for our charges. We're at the bench. Keep in mind, I have a lot of projects going on right now working on the stocks for the FN and the 1903, so I have stuff scattered all over my shop at the moment. I have way more stuff on my bench than I normally do. It's a mess right now. That's not good. You, when you're actually at the bench, at the press, charging powder, you don't want anything there that's not needed. Clean, organized. All right. Even as big of a mess as this is though, there, there are no other bullets here except for the exact number of bullets I'm going to need for this exact number of cases. I put them all up. I don't want to grab the wrong bullet, something like that. The only powder on the bench is the powder I'm loading that's in the dispenser here. Okay, 
I can't make a mistake and accidentally use the wrong powder or put, dump this back into the wrong canister when I'm done, plus extra, if I've only got one canister here. So this part's really important on the staying organized while you're at the bench and only having what you need there in front of you. So and this goes back to what I said before about a process. I make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. I want a process that keeps me from making mistakes. And I've got the load sheet here. So I have the exact charges that I need. And as I load up the cartridges with powder, I'm gonna, as I finish each group, I'm gonna scratch off that charge so I know I'm on to the next one, so I'm not getting confused. Okay, am I loading 56.4 or 55.8? Because about 15 cartridges in, all those numbers kind of start running together. So you know, just be as organized as you can and develop your process and stick to your process. I'm going to dispense my powder. This press here, this is a progressive press. And I haven't talked about presses. Okay, this is a progressive press, but I'm using it just like a single stage press. In other words, when I say progressive... I could have this set up so that the powder dispenser is in the press so that it's priming the bullets as I go. It could be set up so I put in a, a case here. And every time I pull the handle, I pull off a finished bullet every time I pull the handle. It's fast. But it's like a three ring circus when you're running it. There's a lot going on there, a lot of moving things and so forth. Well, with what we're doing for testing, I'm only, you know, doing a certain powder charge for four cartridges and then changing powder cartridges for four more cartridges. And there's no point in doing all this for you know, 28 cartridges. And you don't need a progressive. I, I could do everything I do with a single stage. I would have done this on the single stage that I showed in a previous video that somebody gave me but I just don't have it set up bolted to the bench yet. So, you know, that's my little setup here and then anything you want, you know, you can make it all work. And this is really just for, if you're doing a lot of cartridges, basically for, with a progressive. I do like the turret presses though. That's, if you can afford it, that's pretty nice when you can set your dies and then once they're set, you don't have to go back and reset them. But if you're doing a lot of cartridges like I am, you're constantly resetting your dies anyway. And at the end, we'll, we'll talk about setting the dies because I did get a couple of questions from that from the last video. And we'll touch on that at the end. Okay. With dispensing powder. Okay, I'm going to dispense my powder. I've got a digital scale here. I've had this scale forever. You can use a, a balance beam scale for you know loading and it'll work just fine it's going to be every bit as accurate as this and this, this is what i've been using forever it, it works it works well i use it and i'm not going to set this dispenser so that it's exact or close there's going to be some variation in this especially with this powder because it's coarse you'll feel it actually chopping when you go to dispense powder ball powder is a lot smoother easier all right, so I'm going to have some inconsistencies in my powder weights, but that, that really wouldn't affect my accuracy. And we'll explain why as we go further. But for what I'm doing here with changing every four cartridges, there's no point in setting this. So I'm weighing out every individual charge, and I'm using a trickler to get it exactly where I want it. So we're going to start close to the top. I always like to start with the highest charge and then just work my way down. Fifty-six point four grains. Every time I load a case, I move the funnel to the next one. So anytime that funnel's sitting over a case, I know that case is empty. No powder, so I don't have to worry about double charging, which 
that really isn't an issue with this powder anyway because it, if you double charged a case with this powder it, it takes up such a large volume of the case it would overflow and you would know oops there's some cases you wouldn't know especially pistol cartridges you can double charge those very easily so and pistol cartridges you want to set up some little method at the end just to to check the charge with maybe a stick and a mark on it to my, okay these are all good but you need a system you need to develop a process that you if you follow that you aren't going to accidentally double charge a case so again for me if the funnel's sitting over a case there's no powder in it So we have all of our cases primed and fully charged. I like to go back with the flashlight and look in every case and make sure there's powder in it. You do not want a squib, which is a case without powder but has a primer and then you see the bullet in it and when you fire it, the bullet will lodge itself in the barrel and if you don't recognize that was a squib when you put the next cartridge in to fire it, it's not good. If you're not familiar with squibs, you do a search on that on YouTube. You need to be aware of it. Okay, so I've got powder in every case. I'm not actually going to move my dies. I said I, I would show, I got a couple questions on it. I said I would show how to set the dies. Every set of dies comes with a set of instructions that will walk you through the details. I just don't want to go through. I've got these locked in place and I just don't want to move them. But basically all you would do, you would run your full length sizer die or neck sizer. You would run it down with your ram all the way up. You would run it down till it touched the top of the ram. You would back off on the ram. Then you would turn it an eighth to a quarter of a turn more. Lock it in place and you you'd want to feel that camming action of the ram when you press down you want to feel it pressing that last little bit on the case and the, the instructions will explain it for this particular dial neck sizing and you need to read it for every die just different dies different manufacturers they'll have different setups for this one you would take a case a cartridge and you would run it You would run it into the neck sizer. You would run the neck sizer down until you felt it hit the case. With the ram all the way up, you'd run this down until you felt, felt feel it hit the case. And then you would lower the cartridge. And here I believe it said tighten it an eighth of a turn or back off eighth of a turn. I believe it was back off. Yeah, read the instructions. Don't trust me. But then you would just set it there and you would adjust your length to where you needed it. It's, it's a simple process. For bumping the shoulder, what I said with the full length sizer, and you would run it down till you felt it touch the ram with the ram all the way up. You would let your ram down and then you would just back off of the die one full turn. You know, you'll have to play with it and figure out what works for you. But you would just back off one full turn, half a turn, and then run a cartridge in there and check the cartridge and make sure it was two thousandths shorter or four thousandths shorter. The first time you're not going to see any movement, run it down a little more, you know, take a fresh cartridge with lube on it, run it up, check it, and you just, it's a slow, tedious process. But there are videos, extensive videos, on just how to do that. Okay, so we need to get this set to where we want it for our bullets. And let me go ahead and just back off now, because I don't know how these round noses are going to come out exactly. So. On the scales, they've got scales now that automatically dispense the powder. They're, they're pricey, but 
They are nice if you want to go that route. My friend Joey does that. He's got one. So we're at two inches, eight hundred and twenty thousandths. We want to be at two inches, seven hundred and sixty thousandths. And it should be getting close right there. And I'm going to stop right here. One of those extra cartridges that I talked about having for siding and so forth. Those are really good to set your length with so that if you go too far, you don't have one bullet that's all of a sudden too deep in the cartridges that you're going to actually be testing. Two inches, seven hundred and sixty-three thousandths, seven sixty-two. We're within two thousandths. We're already way off the land. We're going to call that one good. So, the one we already started. And we have exactly 28 cartridges ready to go. But we have one final step. We've got 28 cartridges here in different groups, different powder charges. We do not want to mix these up. We've got testing to do. And trust me, it's easy to mix them up. Just my loading process, just no particular way to do this. Just be consistent in whatever you do. I always start with the highest powder charge first. I work my way back. So each row is the next increment down. So I know which rows which on bullets. Okay, I've got my case here that's just for this rifle. And I'm going to take all of my highest charge and I'm going to put them on one row. I'm going to take my next increment down and I'm going to find my Sharpie. I'm going to mark all of these with the Roman numeral one. Next row is Roman numeral two. Right on the bullet itself. You can mark it anywhere you want. Let me get all of these marked. So they're all marked now, and I know what each one is. Now I'm going to take all of these that I loaded up for extras. I didn't mark them. Now I'm going to take a sheet of paper. And my Create different rows on this sheet of paper with row one being my full charge. I'll draw a line down four so I know there's four bullets in it. And I know it's 56.4. The next one, 55.8 with a four. On down the line, 55.2. Okay, so I've got all of my different loads. I got four cartridges for each listed on the line. The charge is at the top and I'm going to leave this piece of paper in this box. So I know every bullet in this box what the charge is for that bullet. And marking them with the Sharpie. You don't have to do that. That's not necessary. But if you ever turn over a box and dump them out on the ground you're in trouble. And we'll just say that's happened once to me. Once. Okay. It's not going to happen again. <laughs> or, let me rephrase it. It could happen tomorrow. But I'm going to know which bullet's which, and I'm not done for the day with that load testing. Okay, so that's why I like to mark each individual one. So, and again, this stays with it. We know exactly which one's which. These are ready for the range. 
Now I need to do the 30 out 6 and the 270. I followed the same process for the loads for the 1903 with the 150 grain SSTs as I did for the round nose spears for the FN, with the only difference being because I want the higher velocity with the SSTs, 150 grains in the 1903A3, I started at the max charge listed in the manual and then I backed off 1% increments on it. And then I'll have lower velocities for the FN. On the actual testing for these, I'm gonna fire five groups, four shots each for the FN. And all I need for the FN is just accuracy. Which of those groups is the most accurate? If none of them are very accurate, okay, maybe I start adjusting the seating depth on the bullets. And I do have some room there to play. If I get one that's really accurate and I suspect there'll be a couple of groups in there that are pretty accurate. I've got my load. I'll have the powder charge. I'll know which one it is. We're good. I'm ready to go hunting. Plus, I don't have to record the velocities for that. What I said earlier about, you know, the more precision you want, the more it's going to cost you. If I want the velocities, I've got to use a chronograph. I have a chronograph. You don't have to have one, though. I could just go with the most accurate load, know about what it is, and have a reasonable idea of my maximum point blank range. And after we get our velocities, we're going to figure our maximum point blank range for both of these. And I could call it good right there. My testing for the 1903A3, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to fire each group, you know, five different groups, and see which one's the most accurate. But I want a little more precision out of my testing for it. So I also want to see how much variation I have in my velocity for each group. And generally, not always, but generally your most accurate group is going to have the least variation in velocity. And that's extra information I want for this. Well, I'm going to need a chronograph for that. And I want to know what the standard deviation is on my velocity, which basically that's just how much range you had in there for that group from all your shots. So I, I want very little variation in my velocity on the 1903A3. And that extra precision is going to cost my next chronograph. For the 270, I haven't loaded the 270 yet. That's, hey, we're running late now, or running long on this video now. And then, by the way, if you've stuck around to this point, I really hope this helps you out in some way. <laughs> okay. That extra precision, I'm going to pay for it with, with the chronograph. If I wanted to be really precise, I would get a magneto speed to check my velocities. And if I wanted to go even more precise, you know, I'd go with the radar systems they have now. You know, we're talking more money and more complexity there as well with the radar system setting it up, more technology, more to go wrong, more time, more effort, more money, again, precision costs. My little chronograph will be more than accurate enough to do what I need to do for the 1903A3 and you know, we'll go from there. For the 270, I haven't loaded those, but we're going to try something different for those. Instead of loading for groups on it, I'm going to try what's called the Satterley method, which is developed by Scott Satterley, and it's pretty popular now. I'm familiar with that and personally tried it yet. And what the Satterley method does is you go out, you load, we'll just say 10 cartridges at different increments. So there's no groups. And you just fire one shot through the chronograph, get the velocity, go up to the next increment, fire a shot, get the velocity. And you'll see flat spots where your velocity doesn't change much from one charge to the next. Well, those flat spots, that's what you're looking for. And then, so that after you find your flat spot, then you would load a group to that flat spot and check that for accuracy. 
and you could also you will also run a seating depth test to go with that. That's how you'll really dial in that loads by adjusting your seating depth. So theoretically, you should get a super accurate load, super consistent velocities. You're going to you're gonna have to let that seating depth to get it dialed in. With what I'm doing here, my seating depth, seating depth isn't near as critical, which is good. That's, because these are so far off the lands, I don't have much to play with anyway. And these 150 grains, these are a lot shorter. I'm 150 thousandths off the lands with these. But I'm also at the cantilever groove that Hornaday has on these bullets. I didn't crimp these, by the way. I could crimp the Hornaday's because they do have a cantilever groove, crimping groove. My dies would crimp for that. It's roll crimp. But I didn't crimp them. I'm going to get the lead die that you, you don't have to have a cantilever groove to crimp with the lead die. I just don't have one for a 30 caliber at the moment. Well, that's in part why I wanted that extra bearing surface on the round noses just so I've got more to, for the case to grip on. That crimp isn't as important because I did that. And on the 150 grains, I, I could crimp these, but again, I'm just going to hold off until I get the crimping die. But we can go ahead and do our testing. And I said at the beginning that you didn't have to have the little gauge where you check to the o job and base and all that stuff. You really don't. After I loaded these and just eyeballed it to the cantilever groove, which is where Hornaday wants you to load to on these, I checked the overall length with my caliper and I was within four thousandths of what they said to load to in the book if you just check from the tip to the base. 270, that's going to be a little different story though because the bullets are longer for it and I'm shooting 140 grain which is right in the middle of its range. I know I can, I have a, more than enough length on the 140 grains that I can get it to within 20 thousandths and still have plenty of bullet to grip on on the case. So that will come into play with those. It's just not on these particular bullets because they're such lightweight bullets, they're for short. 175 grain bullets, That then I could load these to where they were 20 thousandths off the land and still have plenty of bullet for the neck to grip on. I think that covered it for my load development process. And I didn't cover everything I could. There's just way too much to squeeze in. But for those of you new to this, what I'm hoping for with this is that you just have a good basic understanding of the processes here and why you do what you do or why I do what I do. And I'm hoping you can go watch other videos, and I highly encourage you to go watch other videos. I want you to be able to watch their videos and understand why they're doing what they do. Okay, and it's probably going to be different than what I'm doing. That's that's fine. There's a lot of different ways to do this and accomplish the same thing, which is safe, reliable, accurate ammunition. But once you get to that point that you understand what they're doing, you understand what I'm doing. You can make your own decisions and figure out what's going to work for you. And eventually you're going to end up doing it your own way and developing your own process for all of this anyway. And I would highly recommend it to any of you new to this, go watch Gunblue 490 series on developing loads. It's more in depth and it's really good information. Read your manuals. You really, you're different uh, bullet manufacturers they've got good information in their manuals at the beginning on you know all of this Lyman they've made a great manual for years just you know good information you can't have too many books and Mitch proved that when he pulled out that 12th edition spear that had the information I needed on this bullet that they've discontinued I don't know how many years ago so Okay, if you got any questions, just post them in the comment, and we're not going to get to test these next weekend. 
I've got two rifles torn apart and I don't have anything to test them in. <laughs> but hopefully, we're going to be putting the FN together next weekend. I, I'm hoping. i got to finish the checkering and I'm struggling with that one. We get the checkering done, we'll be putting it together the next weekend. Then the weekend after, we can at least carry it out and the Western. So, God bless and have a good evening.